My name is Stanley Sword. And I have the great pleasure to welcome Jim Quinn, lawyer and one of the 10 top trial lawyers in the USA. You were, you were awarded uh, a couple of times. And you are a specialist in sports law and in commercial litigation. Uh, tell us the courtroom for you. Is it like being in the boxing ring, going into the to the world championship title? Uh, I, I think that's actually a pretty that's that's actually a pretty good analogy. Yes, it's a lot like that. Although, as I think uh, uh, we talked about before, it's a little bit of acting going on at the same time. You want the jury to like you. Uh, but yeah. uh, it is it is a bit of a boxing match, uh, and uh, and it also is enormously fun. Uh, it it, uh, it plays to the ego. Uh, if you feel comfortable in a courtroom, uh, you'll have a lot of fun doing it. And and uh, what's your unique style? How can we say it's Jim in the courtroom? Huh. You know, um, it's a it's a uh, a combination of of charm and aggressive and aggressiveness, uh, mm. because you have to have a bit of both, particularly uh, in front of a jury. Uh, you want a jury to believe that you believe in your your client's uh, position, and uh, and so that's where the aggressiveness comes in. Mm. Uh, at, the, at the same time, you also want the jury to like you, because if you're too much of a bully. Uh, they're not going to like you. Um, and that's one of the reasons you have to be very careful uh, when you're examining and cross-examining witnesses that uh, while you're trying to extract the truth uh, and at the same time, particularly in cross-examination, you're trying to uh, show the jury that the other side is not telling the truth or uh, is misleading them. You have to do it in such a way that uh, doesn't make the jury uncomfortable. Mm. And uh, being a, a, a litigation lawyer, it's big numbers. You were involved in the Arthur Anderson, uh, a big case, fourteen billion dollars was sued on for. Uh, it, tell us. It was a, it, 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 that's the kind of number that gets your attention. There's no question <laughs> about that. Uh, we were very focused. Uh, it was a it was a huge international arbitration involving. Uh, parties from all over the world. Literally, there were over 250 partnerships that were fighting with each other, uh, over $14 billion. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, we, got a, we got an award, uh, and the other side uh, was able to award, avoid having to pay all the $14 billion. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you were also involved in the uh, Don King, the, the legendary yeah. boxing promoter. <laughs> You, on the other yeah, side of a, the ring. That, that was an interesting case. Don King was suing. Uh, my client was ESPN, uh, the obviously the uh, sports uh, cable network. Uh, and he wanted $5 billion because he claimed that we had defamed him, that we had said uh, we had run a story, a historical background story on Don King. And he claimed that we had defamed him. We were actually able to show that he, uh, that Don King was such a bad actor. After all, he was involved. He murdered two people. It's kind of hard to see how you can defame somebody who had been in prison for murdering somebody. Uh, yeah. So we, we eventually were able to get the case dismissed. And are you in flow in the courtroom? What, you know, what, is it like a conductor leading an orchestra? Yeah, just uh, in, in these complicated cases, uh, to some degree, uh, you usually have a team on your side. The other side will have a team. Uh, and as the lead lawyer, uh, you are trying to, you know, you're kind of conducting the whole show. It's it, in, in some ways, you're, you're, it, it's like you were both an actor and a director at the same time of a, of a, of a, of a movie. And uh, the people watching the movie are the jurors. Or to some degree, the judge, if it's a case that's just being tried to the ju to a judge, um, and yeah, you're manipulating and moving pieces around, having your colleagues uh, take different uh, parts. Many of the cases that I've tried over the years would go on literally for three or four months, which is uh, which is a, a daunting task to 
keep everybody going in the right direction. Mm. But if you if you if you're in the sports world and you do you know high jumping, you 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 set the bar. But if you do figure skating, you're being judged, and you as a trial lawyer, you're being judged. How many percentage of of the cases? Do you think it's fair and, and you are satisfied? And how many percentages do you think they were wrong? You know, I, 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 in the many cases that I try, particularly the juries, and uh, I, 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 I you know, have enough ego to say I won most of them, but even the ones that I lost, and I lost a few, including some fairly big losses, um, more or less I always felt that the jury got it right. Uh, that uh, I could understand. Uh, often, uh, these large civil cases that go to trial, uh, they go to trial because uh, they're very close in terms of each side has has very good arguments. And ultimately, the skill is uh, in persuading a jury or a judge that while the other side may have good arguments, your arguments are better. Mm. Your evidence is better. You're more believable. And how big a part is you know preparation? How 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 much is 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 uh, you know talking and 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 uh, being a good um, a good lawyer, so to say? And and how much is you know studying the law? What's the different parts of winning a case? Preparation for these big, complicated cases is hugely important. Um, it may it. it, it it may look like in in the in the courtroom that uh, you're just there winging it, but all of that uh, is based on the fact that you prepared uh, assiduously for perhaps months in advance. Uh, one of the things that has become very popular and, and uh, certainly in large cases uh, is uh, doing uh, practice juries before the case uh, to see how your arguments um, uh, play out in front of mock jurors. And when you find that an argument doesn't work well, then you rejigger your case and, uh, and, and try to figure out what the best arguments are that are going to work. Mm. And what do you think about you know, litigation for the, for the US society, so to say? Because it's, it seems like a big toll on, on corporations and, and, and society. At the same time, the money is going back into the society. So it, it's kind of moving around, just like taxes. Well, you know, one... I, the, 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 the reality is that um, the US litigation practice goes back for hundreds of years. It goes back to the, uh, the beginning of the country. And uh, as I have often said that litigation is the way uh, we in, in, in America resolve our disputes. Uh, people have uh, a high degree of confidence in the, at least Americans, have a high degree of confidence in uh, our legal system. And um, for the most part, uh, people feel, even even after if they've lost a case, that it's it's been fair, that they got their they got their fair shot uh, at uh, at making arguments uh, and had a chance to win. And even if they lose, they, they uh, and we and we do have a system of appellate of, of appeals that uh, can in in a particular instance where something really truly has gone bad, that it can get reversed. Hmm. And uh, the only time you've been sued yourself was in a BMW case. Was a European company. Yes, that was, that, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, a, a very uh, amusing incident where the lawyers on the other side decided that they were going to try to scare the lawyers on our side by suing us personally. And uh, we thought it was, uh, it was it was both funny and stupid at the same time. And we turned it around on them uh, in a way that uh, the judge ended up getting very upset with their side for having sued the lawyers mm. and we got the case dismissed. Yeah. And uh, you also wrote a book about your epic journey and, and you had a chapter about Donald Trump, a man uh, that you got, you were able to get 
paid from eventually. Yes, it was not easy. It's not easy getting paid by Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> he's he's probably uh, stiffed half the lawyers in New York City. Um, I actually represented him in a case uh, which was a non-sports case um, and got him $100 million. Uh, and he still didn't want to pay the, the legal fees. Uh, eventually, uh, I had one of my uh, partners who was involved in uh, one of Donald's many bankruptcies um, uh, was able to uh, persuade Trump to uh, pay our fees or he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be able to get out of bankruptcy. Mm. And, and uh, what were the case about? A hundred million dollars to Donald Trump? It had to do with a, a piece of, uh, of uh, one of his buildings, the United Nations Plaza. It was a dispute actually with the city of New York. Um, the uh, city had uh, initially agreed that if Trump took certain steps in the construction of the of the UN Plaza that um, that he would get a hundred million dollars in tax rebates and they for some reason I don't even remember why anymore they they claimed that they weren't going to give him the tax rebates and we sued the city and after litigating for a year or two the courts found in our favor and got Donald his hundred million dollars in tax rebates but he still didn't want to pay his fees <laughs> And that when you started out, you 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 did forty bucks an hour, and today it's fifteen hundred uh, bucks an hour. It's it's yeah. Uh, well, you know, life's gotten more expensive too, Dan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and you got more experience along the way. When you pay for a you know a, a high priced lawyer, uh, I guess it's like paying for an artist. You pay for the thousands of paintings they already did before, you know, the, all that knowledge yeah, I, you I mean, acquired I, along the way. I, one of the reasons I often you will get hired is the people, uh, clients look to what you've done in the past and how successful you've been. And uh, if they believe that uh, they're, they're comfortable, they'll pay the, 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 the fees. The fees are, 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 are not insubstantial, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, often these cases involve hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars. And uh, as a result, um, the lawyers uh, charge fees that are commensurate with the size of the case. Mm. So it's, it's, it's like if you have an expensive painting, you want to have a good insurance uh, in order to, to, and if you have a big case, you want to have good insurance that you, you want to win it. So and you, you want to make sure, you want to make sure that the lawyers you're hiring have a good track record. Mm. And if you were to, you know, on the other side of the bench, if you had to hire lawyers yourself uh, with all your experience, what would you do then? Well, depending on the case, I mean, that would be part of it. But the first thing I would look at is, as I said, what is the track record of that lawyer or that group of lawyers? How many cases have they tried? Um, uh, have they tried cases that are similar to the kind of case that you have? Um, uh, and uh, and have they won? Um, it, it, there, there can be circumstances where guys tried a lot of cases and he's lost them all. I probably wouldn't hire him mm. or her. Mm. And uh, you you started out outside of New York. Your father worked at Wall Street in the 30s, and then he went to the Second World War. So so uh, he he uh, were in the really tough a tough place in the history of New York. And you experienced two tough episodes, just COVID yourself. You had it this Christmas and, and the whole of New York had a tragic um, history. And then a couple of decades ago, 9-11. Uh, tell us your journey throughout New York and, and, the, and, the, and the decades. Yeah, I mean, it, the uh, New York is a very special place. Uh, it's a special place uh, because perhaps like Paris and London, it, and to some degree Rome, are, it's, it's, it, it's an, an eternal city. And we look at it, I guess New Yorkers are egotistical, so we, we look at New York as the center of the universe. Uh, it's obviously right now going through some issues. I think we also feel very comfortable uh, that it's going to come back and come back in a big way, just like after 9-11. Uh, 
Um, I, I, I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. I was in court uh, uh, and I'd actually uh, gone over, I'd driven over uh, the uh, Lincoln Tunnel and looked up that morning and saw the, uh, the t Twin Towers in a beautiful, sunny, beautiful day. And uh, six, five hours later, they were gone. Uh, and for New Yorkers, that's still a very, very emotional thing. Mm. But we came back. Mm. It's the comeback kid. And uh, Indeed. tell us, uh, you, you have four kids. One of uh, is a lawyer. Four kids, uh, one lawyer, uh, one, one golfer. Uh, I have a son who runs a, uh, uh, lives on Cape Cod in Massachusetts and, and uh, runs a, uh, a, a dog washing store. And, do and he keeps dogs, and his whole life is dogs. Uh, and my oldest daughter uh, has two daughters herself now, one of whom is finishing up medical school. Another of my grandchildren is a, a professional translator in Madrid. Um, and I have several other grandchildren as well, uh, all of whom are now in college. Uh, and this certainly this this year has been interesting for college kids uh, mm. spending you know, uh, some time remote uh, and sometimes in class. Uh, it's been difficult. Uh, that's probably one, one of the more difficult things for uh, for its students here in the United States. But I'm sure it's true in Sweden and elsewhere. Mm. And uh, what's the most important lesson you learned from your father? You know, he never really liked lawyers. That was one of the ironies. My brother and I were both lawyers. Um, but I think uh, the, what I learned most of all uh, from my, my father was um, to make sure that as hard as you work, that you keep a sense of humor uh, and, you, uh, and you treat people with the respect that you want to be treated with. Mm. And uh, did he learn? Did you? Did he learn you about Wall Street and investing as well? And have you invested uh, a yourself? Bit. I, a, a little bit. Um, unfortunately, he he passed away uh, when I was just starting my career, so I didn't get to spend enough time with him uh, to learn more about his business. He he was actually in uh, his his expertise was actually in the airline industry. That's what his mm -hmm. focus was. He should have learned Warren Buffett. He, yeah. he said you need a hotline in order not to invest in airlines. For sure, for sure. It's it's uh, and tell us you uh, the neighborhood you grew up. Uh, you still live there. One of your homes is located outside of New York. Yes, and uh, we live in a place called Armonk in Westchester. I actually grew up in a in a town, uh, another town in uh, in Westchester, a blue collar town called Elmsford. Um, uh, Armonk is a step up from uh, from Elmsford. Mm. And and uh, how has America changed during your lifetime? Ooh, boy, that's I've been you know uh, so many different ways. We've we've got, we just went through uh, uh, four years of of, uh, of Trump. Was thank God that's over. Um, I think you know from a political standpoint, we we are. Uh, in a place where I think nobody wants us to be, with uh, some very deep splits in the uh, in the political world, which I didn't, which didn't exist 15 years ago. Uh, hopefully, we will work that through in the in the next decade. Um, and of course, technology has changed uh, everybody's lives here in the U.S. and around the world. When I think of when I first started practicing. Uh, there was, you know, there was no email. There was, there was no iPhones. There was, you know, when we tried a case, there was no technology. You know, if you wanted to have a picture of something, it literally was just a photograph. Or mm. if you wanted to uh, have a chart, you wrote on on uh, white paper in front of the jury. Now, of course, you do it all on computer, um, and that it's totally changed the way uh, the way the practice of law. Um, ex uh, exists today. And now with uh, COVID and this past year, 
that's also going to have a huge impact on the legal profession mm -hmm. because uh, so much now can be done uh, on on uh, video, you know, on Zoom or the other technologies that are similar to Zoom. In fact, mm -hmm. I just did an arbitration uh, a month or so ago where the entire arbitration, which was originally scheduled to be in London, um, the uh, entire arbitration we did on Zoom uh, with uh, two dozen witnesses, cross-examination, the, the whole uh, complete arbitration. Uh, and it, it actually worked extraordinarily well. And mm -hmm. I had my doubts. We had, uh, I was here in New York, one of the other arbitrators was in Paris, uh, another arbitrator was in London. We had uh, witnesses in Europe, in the United States, um, and somehow it all got pulled together mm. and we finished the arbitration. We just made it, just issuing the award uh, in the last week or so. Uh, and, and I think you're gonna find that that's gonna have a huge, imp that this technology is gonna have a huge impact on uh, how we practice law because I think uh, people are not going to travel as much. People will take depositions on video on, on Zoom. I've already had several arguments uh, with uh, with courts on Zoom, and um, uh, I I don't think it's going to it's not going to go back to the way it was. And uh, do you think that the uh, how the profession of being a lawyer in 25 years will it be disrupted? Uh, like many other jobs, or or is it a safe job, so to say, compared to truck drivers I, and others? I, at least in the United States, I think it's a very safe job. Uh, the uh, our, you know, our our litigation system is such that um, it'll keep lawyers busy for at least another century. <laughs> yeah, and uh, many of tell us your journey into law. Why did you become a lawyer? And and. Uh, how, how did you go about it? Um, I guess, you know, I, when I always think about what made me become a lawyer, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was the movie and the book To Kill a Mockingbird. And, mm -hmm. um, Graham Greene, or? Uh, yeah, it, it, with uh, the, uh, and the, and that legal system and that, that trial, and I remember reading it, I was 12 or 13, and I always said to myself, you know, that's what I want to do. When I went to the University of Notre Dame, I decided to study history because I, it would involve a lot of writing. Um, and I, I had no doubt, even when I was in college, that I was going to go to law school. Originally, I was going to go in, to uh, the University of Virginia and in day school, and then got married and my senior year uh, at Notre Dame and uh, ended up going to law school at night here in New York at Fordham, Fordham Law School, uh, which had a very terrific night program. And um, when I was in my third or fourth year, I was the top of my class. I was still having trouble back then in the early 70s getting a, uh, a job at a big law firm in New York because they didn't hire night students. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, the dean said to me one day, he, he mentioned a couple of law firms that he thought I might uh, try. And one of them was Wild Gotcha and Mangy's. The other one happened to be Scadden Arps, which is also uh, a huge law firm today, international firm. I ended up going to the Wild firm first, and um, they were just beginning to really take off. They were so busy that the uh, the hiring partner, I met him on a Friday and he uh, he offered me a job that afternoon and asked me if I wanted to start on Monday. They were that mm -hmm. desperate for lawyers. <laughs> and I did. I, I called my boss at the publishing firm I was working at and said, I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'm sorry, but I won't be in on Monday. Mm. I took another job. Mm. So you kind of combine combine your your interests in writing, writing about your journeys later on. Yes, uh, as I uh, think I mentioned, I actually have written a book called 
Don't Be Afraid to Win, just published. And it's about uh, the impact of free agency on professional sports in the United States. And I was involved in many of the cases that led to uh, free agency and allowed players to uh, now uh, reach the economic heights that they have, they have reached. So mm -hmm. if people are mad about free agency, they can blame me. <laughs> and uh, how did you come into to, you know, the specialty of sports law and commercial litigation? What when drove I, you there? When I went to Walgachal um, in the early 70s, they had just started a lawsuit um, involving professional basketball. And the case was known as Robertson, Oscar Robertson, very famous player versus the NBA. And that was the first attempt at getting free agency. And one day when I was a very young associate, um, one of the lawyers working on that case asked me if I wanted to work on the basketball case. And I said, let's see, I'm working on securities and I'm working on, you know, commercial cases, basketball. Yeah, I'll pick basketball. So I ended up working on that case and becoming very friendly with the uh, lawyer who ran the union that was backing the, that was backing Oscar Robertson, a fellow by the name of Larry Fleischer. And uh, we became close friends. And through Larry, uh, I met the other union leaders uh, representing the other main uh, sports leagues, Marvin Miller in baseball, Gene Upshaw in football, and um, Alan Eagleson in hockey. And, uh, and over the next course of the next five or 10 years, I ended up uh, doing legal work for all of them. And do you have free tickets everywhere now? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 let's put it this way. I don't have trouble getting tickets. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you, you work with both uh, the Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL. Uh, tell us, what, you know, basket, hockey, football, baseball. Uh, does it differ the law between them or is, this, is it no, sports I, law I, the, the same? Gen, gen, generally, the, the, the issues, the legal issues are the same but they come up in, in, in sometimes in different contexts. Uh, when we were fighting for free agency, for example, the legal issues there were, were similar, but each sport had its own uh, special aspects to it that uh, required, when we would eventually settle, required that um, uh, the, the system that we put together would be somewhat different in each sport. Mm. And uh, is there other, you know, dif differences between them? Uh, different sports, different characters, different uh, temperaments, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll give you one example, which is in the book. Uh, in, in, we were negotiating uh, back, this is 20 or so, so years ago, we were negotiating uh, with some hockey owners, uh, and I was representing the players. And at one point, one of the hockey owners uh, asked me if I wanted to go outside in the hall and have a fist fight, uh, <laughs> because that's what they do in hockey. Uh, yeah. But we, we, we eventually calmed them down and, and uh, uh, we moved on. But uh, so, yes, there, there are differences uh, in, uh, in, in the characters and the different people. Uh, for many years, <clears throat> one of my adversaries, but eventually became sort of a friendly adversary was David Stern, the commissioner of the NBA for many years. And he was a, he was a very unique character, brilliant, um, but, but could, be, could be a tough adversary. Um, so we spent 30 years fighting with each other, but I had a lot of respect for him. Mm. And what's the most traumatic that has happened to you in a courtroom? Hmm. <laughs> I'll tell you the, the, the case that I probably uh, have the most memories for was the case that we tried uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota back in the 90s uh, against the National Football League uh, seeking free agency in football. And that was a trial that went on 
for about four months. Uh, and we had uh, very, we had players, we had owners, we had um, a huge uh, array of different kinds of witnesses. Uh, ironically, we had a jury that was uh, made up of all women, which uh, in a football case would seem unusual. Uh, but uh, it turned out very good for the players because our whole thing was to make the, the, the women jurors like the players and they liked the players better than they liked the owners. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's your biggest loss in a courtroom and, and what have you learned from it? Um, uh, there's actually a tie. Uh, the, the, uh, the one that was the most disappointing loss, because I thought we were right, uh, was a case where, uh, so just a few years ago, actually, representing uh, Exxon, uh, I was uh, my client, and uh, we were sued by the state of New Hampshire uh, for allegedly uh, causing uh, chemicals to get into their groundwater. And, and uh, we had, I think, shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that Exxon was not responsible. Um, but we had a, a jury that uh, uh, they didn't like the thought there was chemicals in their groundwater. And, uh, and we had a judge who was clearly against us. And, uh, and he really turned the jury. And I, uh, I always had a bad taste in my mouth. And that was, just, you know, we ended up losing, I forget, several hundred million dollars. But Exxon, that was not a big deal. But it was the it was the idea of, the, of it that uh, always disappointed me. And I'd lost other cases, but um, that loss stuck in my craw because I thought we were treated unfairly. Mm. And could you have you know done something differently? You know, I that's a great question, and I think because the judge was against us, I don't think anything we could have done would have changed it. Um, uh, yeah, the only thing we could have done differently is we could have settled earlier <laughs> and not gone through the aggravation of the trial. Uh, but um, now I had no regrets that we did, that we would have tried something differently. I mean, there there are times that uh, you you look back and you say I should have done this or I should have done that. That was not one of them. Hmm. And have you ever had any moral aspects on any case? You know that you that you defended someone who 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 won perhaps was guilty and then went on making the same mistakes uh, or something like that? You know, l luckily the answer is no, but I, 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 uh, I think that could happen from time to time, but it never happened to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it, probably one of the other big cases that uh, we, we lost um, was uh, for a French company uh, and it was a securities fraud case, but the reality was they actually had committed fraud. So I wasn't that surprised that we lost. <laughs> and and uh, do you have any other passions in life? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, golf. You know, not that I'm that good at it, but I've been playing it for almost yeah, let's see, 65 years. So uh, I'm still hoping to get better. Uh, I doubt that that's going to happen, but. Uh, we have a we play golf in Arizona, play golf in Met, in Cape Cod, and, and in New York. And uh, in fact, I'm leaving to go to Arizona in a few days to play golf. I mean, it'll be 80 degrees out there, and I'm looking forward to it. Mm. And if you were to meet Donald Trump in a golf game, would you win as you did? In well, the first paid? thing I have to make sure, because he cheats, uh, I'd have to make sure he didn't cheat. And uh, if he didn't cheat in a head-to-head -head game, yeah, I'll beat him. <laughs> Fantastic. J Jim, warm thank you and the best of luck now on your golf game and on your epic journey towards the future. Well, that's great. I, I enjoyed talking with you, Daniel. All the best. Thank you.